Ida Jorgensen was born on August 16, 1894, in the small town of Colonia Diaz, northern Chihuahua, Mexico. Mexican by birth, and yet her name, fair complexion, and light hair told of a Scandinavian heritage. Her father, Eric Christian Jorgensen, was a Danish immigrant, and her mother, Anna Melissa Jonsson, was Swedish. The Jorgensen and Jonsson families had in common a religion that curiously brought animosity and persecution in their homelands. They also shared a strong desire to find a more peaceful existence among others who believed as they did. This new religion had its origins in the small upstate New York town of Palmyra. Here a young boy named Joseph Smith Jr. found himself confused by the various religions in the community. Joseph Smith was, was uh, uncertain and confused and, uh, and uh, made anxious by all of this going on around him. And so he sought an answer uh, following a scripture that said that you were to ask God if you have questions and problems, and that's what he did, and, uh, and had a, a vision, a revelation, which he claimed to have seen God the Father and the Son. And they told him that none of the churches were right, but that if he were, were to live righteously and continue to listen to their counsel, that at some point uh, the, the true church might be restored. I soon found, however, that my telling the story had excited a great deal of prejudice against me among professors of religion and was the cause of great persecution, which continued to increase. Joseph Smith's own family was converted to this faith and unified in their belief in this faith and in the Book of Mormon. And then their neighbors and friends and relatives in upstate New York also were converted to the faith. And that same year of 1830, they sent missionaries over to the Ohio country, a little bit uh, east of Cleveland. And uh, there they began to convert whole congregations of people of the Campbellite faith. Non-members called them Mormonites or Mormons after a new set of ancient scriptures said to have been translated by Joseph Smith. Within the church, they referred to themselves as saints or Latter-day Saints. They addressed each other as simply brother or sister. At the same time, this movement, for reasons that still aren't entirely clear, caused a lot of opposition, a lot of persecution against the Latter-day Saints. Uh, part of it had to do with their having the Book of Mormon, which was seen by the Latter-day Saints as a new scripture. Part of it had to do with Joseph Smith's claiming then to be a prophet and thus authorized to speak for God to mankind. That didn't set too well with old line Protestants. And so there were lots of reasons. Um, part of it had to do with their intense communalism, that they wanted to build a coherent and communal and mutually caring kind of society in, in freewheeling, uh, democratic, every man for himself America that didn't fit very well. Under the counsel of Joseph Smith, the small group of members began to move from upstate New York to Kirtland, Ohio, where they hoped for acceptance and a more peaceful way of life. They desired the freedom to practice their recently embraced religious beliefs. In 1831, he announced where Z the city of Zion was going to be built, and some of his followers began immediately moving down to Jackson County, Missouri, which is close to present-day Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, they, several thousand people gathered to that area, and for a period there were really two Mormon centers, the one up in Ohio, Kirtland, Ohio, and then the one down in Missouri. There were already settlers who had been there, mostly from the south, mostly slaveholders, and the Mormons had come from the north, uh, the northeast. Uh, they tended not to be slaveholders. The Mormons were teaching the Indians and fraternizing with the Indians something that the older settlers did not like. And so opposition uh, uh, grew up. Uh, the Mormon uh, store was burned. Uh, their press was destroyed. Um, Joseph Smith was tarred and feathered, and some of his followers and uh, the Mormons were told they had to leave, uh, this in 1833. Finally, in October of 1833, they were driven from this place across the river, across the Missouri River North, and uh, there they were welcomed by the people just north of the river and found haven for a time. But there again, that many people coming in at once began to f cause some feelings of uneasiness among the older settlers. And so a kind of gentleman's agreement was made by which a county uh, a little bit east and north in central Missouri would be created called Caldwell County, which would be 
considered to be a place, though this couldn't be a, a matter of law, was by gentlemen's agreement a place where the Mormons could settle. Uh, when, when the Kirtland group um, disintegrated for a number of reasons, the general economy was on a downturn, Joseph Smith had helped to sponsor a bank that failed, uh, a number of people uh, were very hostile to him for that and threatened his life. And so he and again a number of his followers migrated from Ohio down to Missouri, just reaching Missouri in the summer of 1838. By the fall of 1838, severe tensions had, had, had arisen between the Mormons and other settlers in Missouri. Uh, Mormon houses were burned and looted. The Mormons did their best to defend themselves. And so it was a very, very tense time uh, in the fall of 1838. Joseph Smith decided and some of his followers decided that they needed to defend themselves and uh, their defense uh, sometimes you meant military action in order to defend themselves and the governor incensed at that uh, issued a, a, an edict that the Mormons must leave the state or be exterminated and so the militia was called out uh, Joseph Smith was arrested and again in the middle of the winter of 38-39, most of the Mormons fled eastward now across the Mississippi River and a little bit north up into Illinois. In Illinois then, uh, they began to uh, look for a possible place to settle and found a tract of land which a land developer had partially uh, developed or at least designated as a settlement place, made negotiations so they could begin purchase of that land. and. Uh, they then began to build on that site a town which Joseph Smith named Nauvoo. The swamp was drained, homes constructed, and farms planted. The church and the town began to grow and prosper. While in Kirtland, the saints had built a temple at the great cost of time and money. The temple was a sacred meeting place, but also represented the willingness of the saints to do all that was requested of them. In Nauvoo, the saints were again asked to donate their time and money for the construction of the Nauvoo Temple. And the church grew doctrinally as well, with a little bit more of an Old Testament emphasis. And beginning in at least 1842, perhaps earlier, Joseph Smith and some of his followers, his closest intimates, began to practice plural marriage or polygamy, which meant that a man could have more than one wife. And these doctrines, together with the growth of the Mormon Church in Nauvoo, uh, the founding of the university there, uh, the strong militia which Joseph Smith headed, uh, all of these uh, again began to cause opposition among neighbors, among people who lived in the area. To the sorrow of Joseph Smith, some of the church's most severe critics came from within. The former members started a newspaper called the Nauvoo Expositor, where they printed anti-church articles that were harshly critical of Mormon leadership. There was a meeting of the city council. The city council condemned the press. They destroyed that press, uh, scattered the type, and uh, that was a very inflammatory act. And uh, there was in uh, nearby towns, particularly the town of Carthage, a strong anti-Mormon uh, sentiment. And uh, Joseph Smith was arrested for treason for this act and taken down to Carthage, Illinois with his brother and some others. And there they were put in the jail uh, until the governor decided what to do. And while they were awaiting jail, uh, some of their jailers uh, joined with a mob of people and uh, stormed the jail and they killed him and his brother and uh, severely wounded others who were there as well. For a few months following the killing of Joseph and Hiram, the saints enjoyed a period of anxious peace. They were counseled by their leadership to plant, build, and avoid conflict. The construction of their temple was renewed with a new sense of urgency, and those who sought the expulsion of the Mormons were angered by the efforts to complete the building of the temple. Uh, and uh, the result then was uh, a heightened suspicion, a heightened concern, and finally by the fall of 1845, uh, uh, an ultimatum given to the Mormons that they must leave and, and, and move out somewhere. They, couldn't no, they could no longer live in Illinois and uh, Iowa, where some of them were living across the river. Again, homes were burned. Uh, people were driven from their homes. And uh, Brigham Young and the leaders of the church promised that the Mormons would leave uh, as soon as grass grows and water runs, that is, in the spring of 1846. 
But the saints were not allowed to wait until spring, and the first wagons began to be ferried across the Mississippi on February the 4th, 1846. The temperatures were extremely cold, and those who began their journey across Iowa found the trail heavy with mud and travel slow. The weather continued to deteriorate, and there was a drop to even more frigid temperatures. Although the conditions were extremely harsh, there was a silver lining as the saints could now continue their Nauvoo exodus by driving the wagons across the Mississippi on the ice. The winter of 46, 47 was a miserable winter. Many, many people did, died, disease broke out among them. They did survive and early in, uh, in the spring of 1847, Brigham Young and a crack crew, 148 people, headed west a pioneering group to see if they could find a settlement place. It was a very dramatic moment in American history. The Brigham Young himself arrived on the 20, 24th of July of 1847, a very famous day in Utah history. The church grew rapidly, mainly because of British and Scandinavian conversions. And then they were gathered to Utah, and so Utah grew very rapidly, but not so much from the American missions as from the British and Scandinavian missions. Bent Janssen's family settled in central Utah, where Melissa was born. Eric Christian Jorgensen immigrated at the age of 12 with his older brother Hans. The rest of the family came as their resources allowed. Brother Johnson joined the church at the age of 16 and was soon called to teach the religious message to others in his country. His efforts were met with a strong and sometimes dangerous resistance. The reason he had that lump on his head was because one fellow hit him with a club. He said it didn't even knock him down. It just, he said the Lord was with me. In 1852, Brigham Young now president of the Mormon Church and prophet of the Mormon people, had announced that they practiced plural marriage. And so it was publicly acknowledged that they had multiple wives. That outraged the American public. And there were strong people lobbying Congress right from that time on to do something about the Mormon problem. And polygamy had, from the beginning of the Republican Party, been associated with slavery. In 1856, Republican Party platform talks about the twin relics of, of uh, barbarism, uh, slavery and polygamy. Chris Jorgensen took Karen Maria Christensen, also a Danish immigrant, as his wife in 1881. The following year, Anna Melissa Janssen consented to become his second wife. So federal judges in, in all these areas, in particularly Idaho, Arizona, and Utah, where there was a Mormon presence, began to, to prosecute the Mormons under these federal laws very vigorously. Uh, about 1,300 Mormons were arrested, fined, and put in jail, various places, uh, some from Arizona in Detroit, Michigan, thousands of miles from their own homes, far away from their families, they saw it as an American Siberia. Many of them had moved from wherever it was they lived in Europe or the United States to move to Utah. They'd already made considerable sacrifices. They weren't very likely to give up plural marriage simply because they'd spent six months in jail. And everyone, every man had this option that if he swore that from henceforth he would keep the law, that he was let go and did not go to prison. Options to avoid arrest were few, but pluralist husbands were creative and persistent in their attempts to elude federal marshals. For their part, the federal authorities offered divorce or abandonment as the only means to avoid capture and imprisonment. Certainly in the Mormon community it was uh, looked down upon that this, this was a man who had betrayed his wives, he had betrayed the community in not standing by his principles. Um, so while it was very unpleasant to go to jail, nobody sought it out, um, there was a certain kind of honor that was given to those men who did go to prison. It was in the midst then of, of this uh, 
vigorous prosecution of Mormons under the anti-polygamy statutes that Mormons begin to look for places to settle outside of the United States where they might be able to continue to practice the law of marriage as they understood it. The Mexican government was interested in settling that northern area in Mexico. The general who was in charge of this department had spent a few days in Salt Lake City and he'd seen what the Mormons had done up there and so he says, oh, by all means, if the Mormons want to colonize, they'll come down and they'll improve this country. Latter-day Saints brought with them a number of skills. That would be very helpful. After all, Latter-day Saints were among or the first uh, to start irrigating here in the West to take uh, essentially desert land and reclaim it for agriculture. Polygamy was against the law in Mexico. Um, there's grown up a tradition that uh, people went there because it was not against the law. It was against the law, and people at the time knew it was. The practice of polygamy was simply ignored by the Mexican officials because of potential benefits they hoped would come by allowing the Mormons to settle in an impoverished Mexico. They settled in Colonia Diaz, and they settled in here in Dublin, and in Colonia Juarez, and then later up in the Pacheco, in the mountains, and Garcia, and Chuchupa. Seeking new areas to settle, some of the colonists moved west into the beautiful Sierra Madre Mountains. The mountain colonies were more limited in their farming potential, but would provide most of the timber needed by the lower colonies. There was a lot of timber, and saw milling, and made lumber, and cattlemen and cattle and, and sawmill and had little and little farms. And then they opened up two over in Sonora, went to Oaxaca and uh, Colonia Morelos. To escape arrest and prosecution as a polygamist in Utah, Chris and his family made the difficult decision to leave their comfortable Utah home, a productive farm and an established freighting business, to go with other saints for what they hoped would be a permanent sanctuary in Mexico. The journey to Mexico began in the summer of 1890 and included Karen with her four young children and Melissa with her three traveling by train to Deming, New Mexico. Chris took two freight wagons, four draft horses, and two breeding horses in freight cars. The Jorgensen family traveled with Karen's brother, Andrew Jensen, his two wives and their children. In a temporary camp just south of Deming, New Mexico, tragedy struck the two families. Four-year-old Thomas Jensen died of diphtheria. Their mother buried her, her oldest on the bed, on the way down there. This one was their oldest and she was four years old. After burying their precious children in Deming, the family moved on southwest into Mexico, where they settled in the new Mormon settlement of Colonia Diaz. By the time the Jorgensen family arrived, heavy mesquite had been cleared, ground leveled, farms planted, and the town was beginning to show promise. It was reported that there had been over 2,000 shade trees, 15,000 fruit trees, and 5,000 grape vines planted but the town was young and accommodations for new arrivals were meager. Home for the Organsons during their first year in Mexico was to be a wagon box and tents. At some later time they lived in a, a cabin or that they, with a dirt roof and when it would rain uh, they would take every pan in the house and, and put under the, on the beds and around to catch the drips of mud that came through the, the sod or the dirt roof. That spring, farmland was purchased and a small farmhouse built. And during the summertime, Grandma Mariah would move with her family out to the farm because it was bigger and there was more help. You know, the children helped on the farm. The farm was just across the river to the south and not too far from the town is in Shell. The adobe house was later sold and another home was purchased in town. 
The home had two rooms downstairs, two sleeping rooms upstairs, and a food pantry under the stairs. In the front yard was a huge mulberry tree. The first common building constructed in each of the colonies would be a church serving extra duty as a schoolhouse. Family, religion, education, hard work, and brotherhood were the cornerstones of life in the colonies. Their communal lives created a society within Mexico and yet distinctly separate. Although subject to Mexican law, the colonists usually found direction from their religious leaders in the areas of education, social activities, and even judicial issues. Our schools there were really good. They were very good. Their, their seventh grade would be just as good as their In fact, um, we were ready for high school, ready for the academy. Formal education was considered to be a critical part of their children's lives, and interruptions to the learning process were not tolerated. We had men teachers mostly. They believed in the, the raw rather than sparing the child. Ida and the other children loved to ride horses or burros they rounded up in the heavy mesquite. With a little imagination, this favorite pastime could also soften the drudgery of education. And one time we slept school. This was the whole school. Oh. We went out in the willows and the I think we went clear to the willow. There was a button willow past us. We, we thought that was the biggest joke there ever was. All day long, and we never had anything to eat. We just rode burros, and we played, and we had fun out in there. And when my father heard about it, he, he said, well, I guess kids will play. So I guess they have to have their prank. Horses, mules, and burros were essential for work and transportation, but they were often the source of adult competition or childhood games. We had a great big uh, ditch right in front of the place, and it was always full of water. And uh, when the burro would get tired of walking around, he'd go to this ditch, and he'd sit down in it, and we'd all slide off into the water. Other games were simple and limited only by imagination. And we had a wall, an adobe wall, and it was wide enough that you could sit on it and play. And we used to sit on that wall, and we'd take these here cuckleburrs. When they were green, you could build all kind of furniture. We could be, make dolls. Colonia Diaz had an opera hall for plays, musicals, and other social activities. Music, plays, dances, and parades were all vital ingredients in the social life in the colonies. Chris participated in the Colonia Diaz Band as a drummer and provided games at the children's dances and church socials. At the regular adult dances, which were held every other Friday evening, he was the floor manager and took turns calling the dances. In Mexico, Chris continued to work as a farmer, carpenter, and freighter. He found work threshing wheat and on the construction of a railroad bed. At times he made and sold cheese. Work was hard and the money was scarce for most colony families. Maria and her oldest daughter, Elnora, found work in El Paso or cooked for the railroad construction crew in order to have cash to buy clothing or cloth. We had two dresses and we'd have to... All I remember is those two lawns. <laughs> Yes, they were hand-me-downs, and then uh, I remember wearing pants that was made out of uh, uh, wagon cover. Meals came from their individual efforts. Chickens laid eggs and were tasty Sunday afternoon fryers. A few hogs were raised behind the home in town. Dairy cows provided fresh milk, cream, butter, and cheese. Fruit and vegetables came from a large garden and orchard. But we had to work awful hard. We had big gardens, big gardens. And we'd have to get up just as early as possible. The minute you could see, we had to be out. Just as the Mexican officials had hoped, 
the colonies grew and prospered through hard work and the cooperative efforts of the Mormons. They planted the first apple trees and the first orchards in this whole country. And, uh, and then, of course, they had the first uh, flour mill, flour grist mill. And, uh, and uh, of course, they had a, saddle shop, a tannery and saddle shop and stores and, you know, and, and in stores, mercantile business. And uh, they had to be self-sufficient. Ida was the fifth child and third daughter born to Melissa and Chris. She was the second child born to them in Mexico. In total, there were nine children born to Karen Mariah and seven to Anna Melissa. Just one month before Ida's seventh birthday, Melissa gave birth to her seventh child. The birth was very difficult and had serious complications, and the new baby Hiram lived for only a day. Melissa's condition continued to worsen. Ida's last memories of her mother was wiping her forehead and trying to make her comfortable in the heat of late July. I remember I was in another room with my little sister. And I remember my father coming in and he took us both in his arms. And He said, Heavenly Father has taken Mama home. Colonia Diaz, August 1st, 1901. Brother Janssen and all in the family. It is with great sorrow that I break the sad news to you of Melissa's departing this life, July 30th, 1901. I can't write more this time, but will try and give you a full account of it in a few days. Hoping this will find you all well, I am, as ever, yours, E.C. Jorgensen. After Melissa's passing, most of the children were gathered to the house in town where there was more room, and the 13 children between the ages of one year to 18 would now be Karen Mariah's responsibility, and the family would yet grow by one additional child born to Mariah, bringing the total to 14. The loss of a wife and mother was an enormous sorrow for all the family. And yet for young Ida, the death of her mother seemed to be an even greater struggle. Her confusion and sorrow seemed to play out in relationships with her siblings or other children. Even as an adult, she found her feelings difficult to explain. And they couldn't understand. They used to call me a booby, and, and then the kids used to laugh at me and say, you can't play with us, you haven't got a mama. I remember we were at the table, and Joe kept teasing me. He teased me and teased me and teased me. And we were all at the table, and I just see my father was sitting at the end of the table, and I was sitting right to the side of him, and Joe was by me. And I just picked up my glass of milk and threw it in his face. Well, I expected a spanking. Uh, that time, Father seen it all. Made Joe get up and scrub the floor. I was just the oddball. That's what they called me. I'm just the oddball. At age 11, it was decided to send Ida to live with her mother's parents in Utah. Perhaps Chris was hopeful that growing up in Utah, away from painful memories, might provide Ida a more normal childhood. You know, a little 11-year-old, I didn't realize that I was leaving home and all the ones that I loved so dearly. I thought that it was so exciting, you know, we go to El Paso. Father, I don't know how he met the lady, but he met a lady there and put me in her care. I can just see him now crying when he took me in his arms. Ida's grandmother, who had not seen her oldest daughter, Melissa, since she left for Mexico, nor had she seen any of her grandchildren that had been born after they left Utah, the resemblance between Ida and her mother must have been strong. My grandmother's name was Anna. I can just see my little grandmother. 
when she took me in her arms. And all I remember is saying was, oh, Melissa, Melissa. My mother had died, you know. She had never seen her since she left from Mexico. She'd never seen me before. How, and since then I realized what an awful thing it was for her to see her oldest daughter, oldest child, leave and she'd never seen it again. But the separation from her family in Mexico created a terrible loneliness for Ida. Then uh, I just got so homesick. It was, it was terrible. It was arranged for her grandfather, Jorgensen, to take her by train to El Paso, where Ida's father would meet her. It took about five days. About all I can remember was the cinders and the, and the heat. After returning to Mexico, Ida often lived with the widow Louisa Peterson and her daughter. Pleasant memories came from her time with the Petersons. The widow sewed the only new dress that Ida had owned, and she was also able to give Ida a beautiful porcelain doll. She gave me a little china dolls with the black hair painted on them, and oh, I loved it. And then she dressed it up real cute. She was very good to me. And then my little sister Carrie didn't have a doll. Carrie was the sweetest thing to me that ever was. She's quite a bit younger than I am. And so I gave her that ball. I love my brother, dearly love. We had lots of fun together. At the age of 15, Ida's life was to take another tragic turn. Ida's father became seriously ill with what was thought to be due to his chronic stomach problems. Through much of his adult life, Chris had problems with a bad stomach and found it necessary to be careful of the food he ate. It soon became clear that this illness was much more serious, and yet there was little that could be done for Chris. And I went in to see him before he gave me a blessing. Because he knew I was going to be alone. But that was one of the hardest things I ever did. Chris had died of what was later believed to be a ruptured appendix. He left behind a widow to care for the two families. I nearly, I nearly lost my mind when my father died. But I got so I just, uh, I couldn't, I just couldn't take it. Now with the loss of both parents, Ida was overcome with grief, and yet while mourning, she could not cry. And I had just crawled into bed when I uh, crawled down into bed. And my father came to the foot of my bed, just as plain as it could be. And he just stood there a minute and then he said, no, he said, my girl, I can't rest as long as you're grieving. He says, and I can't do my work. And he left me. But I hadn't even been able to cry. I never even cried at the funeral. I couldn't cry. But this opened the flood of tears at me. It became necessary for those in the Organson family who were able to work to find work outside the home. Ida began work as a domestic for other families, helping in a small way to sustain her family. I didn't like it, but I had to. I was just a slip of a girl. I wasn't very big. And I was so skinny, and I had, I had um, a lot of trouble with my stomach. I used to just pass right out. I was work, scrubbing, cleaning, washing, and You didn't get paid very much. I want some wild old money, but most of the time, eggs or something. The year was 1910 and it had been 25 years since the first Mormon immigrants began to settle in Mexico. A new generation had been born and raised in Mexico. Many of the settlers had died and were buried in their adopted homeland. 
However, the beginning of the end of the peaceful sanctuary for the Mormon colonists was already starting to unfold. Porfirio Diaz had been president of the Republic for several decades, had established stability, had welcomed the Mormons when they came down because he was interested in economic development. But in 1910, there was a revolution against his rule, and the uh, revolution ended up with uh, Francisco I. Madero becoming the president of Mexico. And that in turn spawned, in, for various reasons, other revolutions, counter-revolutions. And one of them centered in the area of the Mormon colonies in Mexico and was led by a man named Pascual Orozco. As the revolution developed in 1910 and 11, there were a number of incidents where these various revolutionary groups uh, took supplies. Uh, often they would give a receipt, which was never valuable <laughs> for what they took. And the, the Mormons in general would be willing to give them what, as little as they could, but what they needed in order to pacify the various revolutionaries. It takes weapons and ammunition to fight a war and the United States had become the primary source of arms for both sides. But in 1910, the U.S. political position changed. The United States government put an embargo on the importation of arms into Mexico, and the revolutionaries had the main source of their, their weapons was the United States, which they would bring in through, through El Paso principally. The revolutionaries, angry at the United States' new position on exporting arms to Mexico, now look to the Mormon colonists as a preferred source for weapons, ammunition, and other supplies. The U.S. Secretary of State advised all Americans to leave Mexico. Of the interest then of the, of the uh, Oroquistas was in obtaining rifles which they thought were in the possession of the colonists. And the colonists felt that they had an obligation to protect themselves. They felt that they, without weapons, they would be at the mercy of the various groups that were there. The Mormons' religious leader at the time was 33-year-old Junius Romney, who was told by General Jose Salazar in July to submit a complete list of all guns owned by church members Romney, as well as other church leaders, were concerned that this was just the first step in confiscating the weapons, which would put the Mormons at the mercy of the two armies. While the Mormons were delaying submitting the list, Salazar began a campaign to incite the Mexicans in the region against the Mormons. And then recognizing that the, uh, Salazar and the rebels were serious, they're uh, indicated by their action, also by comments that suggested they, they intended to obtain the weapons by force if they didn't get them uh, voluntarily, that the saints were imminent danger uh, of their lives. It was determined then in the consultation that, it, that the saints would send their women and children to the United States. On July 27th, several hundred rebels armed with cannons and Gatling guns positioned themselves around Dublin while others looted the town. The townspeople were ordered to surrender all munitions. It was agreed to deliver their guns to a central location, but secretly they were advised to only deliver those guns that were in poor working condition or without ammunition. Arrangements were made for the necessary trains to take the women and children to El Paso. Some were determined not to stay another night and left immediately for the United States. The people of Colonia Juarez made a similar decision. The following day, they delivered their poorest guns to the rebels and began sending the women and children to El Paso by train. Runners were dispatched to the more distant colonies and a runner arrived at Colonia Diaz in the early morning hours of July 28th. At a 7 a.m. meeting, it was decided to send the women and children by wagon or foot directly to the location in the United States closest to them which was the Corners area of New Mexico, just 19 miles to the north. Well, at 3 o'clock Sunday morning, you know, I must have been dreaming that the bishop's wife was shaking me. She says, I had to get up. You've got to be ready to leave. The Mexicans are coming. So 
it. Oh, good. They haven't left me. I thought I must have been dreaming that they had left me. Well, we had to be out by 10 o'clock that morning. Under the threat of an attack by the rebels, the evacuation was swift and immediate. Uncle Art, when he, uh, when he was told that he had to leave and he couldn't take his wagon, he climbed a big uh, mulberry tree, I think it was, that was that the branches uh, leaned over the roof of the house, and he pulled his wagon up, climbed this tree and pulled his wagon up, and hid it in the branches of the uh, on the roof of the house, and uh, hoping the Mexicans wouldn't find it. It was the 28th of July, and uh, everything was. The hay was in, the wheat was in, and everything was in. The grain was bulging with We had everything, but couldn't take it with us. I didn't know what I was going to take with me. Everything I tried to take with me, they said, no, there's no room for it. I only owned one pair of shoes. So I went barefoot most of the I would ride in the, in the buggy, in fact, it was too crowded. So I walked. Most believe the expulsion was to be temporary, and yet for some, it was difficult leaving behind loved ones who had passed away and were buried in Mexico. I just see that long, long, long string of wagons, and some covered wagons, some. That was the hardest thing for me when we I still felt I could leave him my father and mother there. The journey was hot, ankle deep in dust, and they were in constant fear of being overtaken by the Mexican rebels. It was just at dusk when we got into the three corners, but we hurried as fast as we could because we were, we were frightened. When the last wagon got in and they had closed the gate, the heavens opened and it poured. It poured buckets. It wasn't just a uh, cloudburst. It was a miracle because the Mexicans couldn't catch us then. I think we stayed there about two or three days, and then we left and went to Hachita, where the army had put up, had brought a, a bunch of tents in, army tents. And then it was confusion. And, Fiercely independent, the refugees were now completely dependent upon the United States government for their sustenance. Tents and rations were provided, and apparently canned salmon and sardines were in great supply. We got the sardines and salmon and beans. And that's about all I remember of the diet that we had. I got so sickened on sardines and salmon that just the smell of just ooh. It was a reflection upon the organization of the Mormon Church in Mexico that they were able to evacuate the women and children so quickly without any serious injury or accident. As was the case with the early saints in Ohio, Missouri, and Illinois, most personal possessions were left behind, hopefully to be protected by the men who remained in Mexico. The exodus and the return really are not just events that happen in a given day. The exodus itself covered more than a month, and it took place in various stages. They had a birthday party on the, on the, on the 18th. Then while we were having a party, your Uncle Ed came and, and told me that uh, your Aunt Tilda and I were leaving the next morning at 1 o'clock for El Paso. We went to the lumber yard, and the lumber yard was nothing but corrugated iron up and down and on the roof. And it was hot. We nearly died. And it was the most the saddest thing you could ever imagine. All these people, mothers with babies, mothers having babies. 
it was so terrible. The flies were bad. We laid on these hard boards, and there was hardly room for you to even lay down. It was so, so packed with refugees. In Mexico, the colonists were prosperous and lived in homes that were comparable to the nicest homes in El Paso. Now, they were destitute with very few possessions, little cash, and dependent on others for their most basic needs. There in El Paso, everybody was geeking at us like we was a bunch of... That was the hardest part of it. They all thought it was a temporary departure. And so as soon as they left, some went back to check after their homes and some after their cattle. Grandpa went back in his official capacity and as a personally to check the circumstances to see if they had changed sufficiently to warrant his uh, official recommendation as a state president that it would be good to return and also to see whether or not it would be safe for his family to return. While the Diaz saints were thinking of when they might return home, the rebels were making certain there would be little to return to. In September, the refugees were told of the looting and destruction of their homes and property. A few months later, the town was set on fire and over 40 homes destroyed. I think it's worth noting that it, it may be justifiable in calling the, the exodus in 1912 as the last great Mormon exodus. It has features that can be compared profitably with the exoduses that are more commonly studied in, uh, from Kirtland initially, from Jackson County, in northern Missouri, from Illinois out west, and then uh, the move south, so-called, during the Utah War in 1857. And finally they said there was no chance of going back, so it killed an eye on a train to go down to Price. And we had about five or six days on the train. Ida and Tilda were old enough to help provide for themselves and were sent to live with relatives in Utah that had need of their help. Ida was to live with her mother's brother Hiram, a widower living in Richfield with seven children. Hiram's children had been sent to live with other families in the community. I think I was more worried to him than I was anything else, but I brought his family together. That's one thing between us. We got the family together, and they had been separated for, since their mother died. Others gradually returned to what they could recover in Mexico. The decision of those who went back was quite, was equally within the official position of the church which said those who desire to may return and those who desire not to are free to go wherever they may choose. 20% perhaps of those who had originally been in Mexico returned who then have provided a, a faithful core of saints for various things in Mexico, ecclesiastically, Latin America, in the uh, mission presidents and so on in a way that could not have happened otherwise. Even in the United States, hardship and tragedy continued to follow the Jorgensen family. Sarah, Ida's oldest sister, also died from childbirth. Her brother Leonard was killed in a Colorado boiler explosion, and a brother Frank was killed in France during World War I. I said goodbye to him just about the last day before I went when he, he put his hand out through the window, they wouldn't let us in the train, and he put his hand out through the window and he said, I'll never see you again. Ida Jorgensen's life was one of hardship and family tragedy, shared by the entire Jorgensen family. As a girl, and even as a young mother, Ida struggled with the grief caused by the loss of those closest to her. As a mature adult, she found strength and comfort through her faith in God and the belief that she would again be with her family. The descendants of these courageous people now live in the two remaining colonies, Dublon and Juarez. The character and faith of their ancestors are reflected in the lives of those who live there now. They are third and fourth generation Mexican citizens
and farming is still the predominant industry. Church, family, and education remain their most important priorities. Ida was married to William George Ogilvy for 57 years before his passing in 1971. Together, they parented nine children. As was her mother, her father, and all of her brothers and sisters before her, Ida was taken home by her Heavenly Father on May 29, 1990.